Hello, I'm Owen Colfer, author of the Artemis Fowl books, and I'd like to read you an extract from my latest book, Artemis Fowl and the Atlantis Complex. And in this piece, Artemis has been struck down by the Atlantis Complex, which is not a place, but it's a brain disorder, which combines OCD, delusional dementia, and also multiple personality. So Artemis now is in a crisis. He's in Iceland. There's a huge probe descending from space that's going to kill them all. And he's fixating on the number four, which he believes stands for death. And also, he doesn't believe the probe is real, because he thinks it's just one of his delusions. And all around him, his friends are saying, get out of the way, get out of the way. But he refuses to believe that anything out of the ordinary is happening. That ship has four engines, thought Artemis. Four! Four means death. As if to confirm this thought, or indeed prompted by the thought, an orange bolt of energy appeared at the very tip of the descending craft, roiling nastily, looking very much like a bringer of death. Orange energy, noted Holly, shooting it with a finger gun. You're the explainer guy, Foley. Explain that! Worry not, lesser intellect, said Foley, fingers a blur across his keyboard. This ship is unarmed. It's a scientific probe, for God's sake. That plasma bolt is an ice cutter. No more than that. Artemis could hold in the tremors no longer, and they racked his slim frame. Four engines, he said, teeth chattering. F -f Four is death. Vinaya paused on her way to the shuttle gangway. She turned, a sheaf of steel hair escaping her hood. Four is death? What's he talking about? Before Holly could answer, the orange plasma beam bubbled merrily for a moment, then blasted directly into the shuttle's engine. No, 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 said Foley, speaking as one would to an errant student. That's not right at all. They watched horrified as the shuttle collapsed in a ball of turgid heat, rendering the metal shell transparent for just long enough to reveal the writhing marines inside. Holly dropped low and dived towards Vinaya, who was searching for a pathway through the flames to her men inside. Commander! Holly Short was fast, actually getting a grip on Vinaya's glove before one of the shuttle's engines exploded and sent Holly pinwheeling through the superheated air onto the roof of the great Skua restaurant. She flapped on the slate like a butterfly on a pin, staring stupidly at the glove in her hand. Her visor's recognition software locked on to Commander Vinaya's face and a warning icon flashed gently. Fatal injury to central nervous system, read a text on her screen. Holly knew the computer was saying the same thing in her ear, but she couldn't hear it. Please seal off the area and call emergency services. Fatal injury, this couldn't be happening again. In that nanosecond, she flashed back to her former commander, Julius Root's death. Reality returned in a fiery heat wave, turning the ice to steam and popping the heat sensors in Holly's suit. She dug her fingers into the roof slush and hauled her upper body higher. The scene played around her like a silent movie as her helmet filters had expanded and ruptured in the nanosecond between the flash and the bang. Everyone in the shuttle was gone. That much was clear. Don't say gone, say dead. That's what they are. Focus, she said aloud, pounding her fist into the roof to emphasize each syllable. There will be time to grieve later. This crisis was not past yet. Who is not dead? She was not dead, bleeding but alive, smoke drifting from the soles of her boots. Vinaya, oh gods, forget Vinaya for now. And in a snowdrift underneath the eaves, she spotted Foley's legs doing an inverted gallop. Is that funny now? Should I be laughing? But where was Artemis? Suddenly Holly's heartbeat was loud in her ears and her blood roared like the surf. Artemis! Holly's journey to a crouch was harder than it was supposed to be and no sooner had her knees found purchase than her elbows gave way and she ended up almost back where she'd started. Artemis, where are you? Then from the corner of her eye, Holly saw her friend loping across the ice. Artemis was apparently unharmed, apart from a slight drag in his left leg. 
He was moving slowly but determinedly away from the burning shuttle, away from the crank and blackening of contracting metal and the mercury drip of stealth ore finally reaching its melting point. Where are you going? Not running away, that was for sure. If anything, Artemis was moving directly into the path of the still falling space probe. Holly tried to scream a warning. She opened her mouth but could only cough smoke. She tasted smoke and battle. Artemis, she managed to hack after several attempts. Artemis glanced up at her. I know, he shouted, a ragged edge to his voice. The sky appears to be falling, but it isn't. None of this is real. The ship, those soldiers, none of it. I realize that now. I've been, I've been having delusions, you see. Get clear, Artemis, cried Holly, her voice not her own, feeling like her brain was sending signals to someone else's mouth. That ship is real, it will crush you. No, no, it won't, you'll see. Artemis was actually smiling benignly. Delusional disorder, that's all this craft is. I simply constructed this vision from an old memory. It, one of Foley's blueprints I sneak to look at. I need to face my dementia. Once I can prove to myself that this is all in my head, then I can keep it there. Holly crawled across the roof, feeling her insides buzz as magic went to work on her organs. Strength was returning, but slowly, and her legs felt like lead pipes. Listen to me, Artemis, trust me. No, Artemis barked. I don't trust any of you. Not Butler, not even my own mother. Artemis hunched his shoulders. I, I don't know what to believe or who to trust, but I do know that there cannot be a space probe crash landing here at this precise moment. The odds against it are just too astronomical. My mind is playing tricks on me and I have to show it who's boss. Holly registered about half of that speech, but she'd heard enough to realise that Artemis re was referring to his own mind in the third person, which was a warning sign, no matter which head doctor's theories you subscribe to. The spaceship continued to bear down on them, unaffected by Artemis's lack of belief in its existence, shunting shockwaves before it. For a memory made flesh, it certainly seemed very real, each panel richly textured by the tribulations of space travel. Long, jagged striations were etched into the nose cone like scars from lightning bolts, and buckshot dents peppered the fuselage. A ragged semicircular chunk was missing from one of the fins, as though a deep space creature had taken a bite from the passing craft, and strangely coloured lichen was crayoned in the square patch vacated by a hull plate. Even Artemis had to admit it. That doesn't seem particularly ethereal. I must have a more vivid imagination than I had thought. Two of the ship's silencers blew out in rapid succession. An engine roar filled the bowl of grey sky. Artemis pointed a rigid finger at the craft. You are not real, he shouted, though even he did not hear the words. The ship was low enough now for Artemis to read the message written in several scripts and pictograms across the nose cone. I come in peace, he mumbled and thought. Four words, death. Holly was thinking too, images of tragedy and destruction flashing past like the lights of a train carriage. But there was one notion holding steady through the chaos. I can't reach him from this rooftop. Artemis is going to die and there is nothing I can do but watch. And then a hysterical afterthought. Butler is going to kill me.